Um, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Kyle Brinda with uh, his talk, uh, All Microbes on a Flash Drive. Uh, so thank you again. Thank for your patience to you too. And uh, please start with your talk. Thank you very much. So I will just ask, can you see my slides and can you see uh, my face? Yes. Does everything work perfectly? Yes, Perfect. Everything is thank perfect. You. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for the introduction. It's my pleasure here to present uh, my work here at DSB. Uh, this is actually a very DSB work because many of the ideas which we have been using throughout the presentation came from DSB, I think 2016 or uh, one of the DSBs many years ago uh, when I attended the last time. So my name is Karol Jinda and I'm a postdoc at Harvard Medical School working with Michael Bain. In general, we are interested in different aspects of antibiotic resistance, and uh, we use many different methods going from experimental biology to computer science. And as such, we are very much interested uh, in how to search across all microbial sequence data. So, uh, yeah. So, in general, in biology, there is in different parts of biology, there is a huge interest in genome collections. And genome collections have been instrumental to many biological discoveries. So for instance, many genome editing tools uh, really required uh, huge collections of, of genomes. And uh, at different stages of the discoveries, people were actually looking at across many different species at uh, big data, for, uh, at diverse data. However, it's, it's very well known uh, within this community. Due to the exponential growth of data, compressing and indexing becomes very hard so just one motivation example, just one motivation figure, that you look at the number of bacterial assemblies in gene bank, and it's a log scale. You can see that it's really growing exponentially. So there's the big question, how to keep up uh, with, the, with the growing amount of data. And as a very specific example of a data set, which is really huge and difficult to work with, I can provide the complete microbial corpus that it has been built uh, two years ago by Zam Iqbal and uh, his team. So at that time, they were interested in the question how to search across all microbial sequence data and, for instance, how to identify antibiotic resistance genes uh, within the whole corpus. And to do that, they downloaded at that time the all microbial uh, samples which were available on SRA and ENA. And for all of them, they constructed clean De Bruyne graphs. So basically, they, they download the reads, then uh, they counted the chambers, removed the chambers which corresponded, which likely corresponded to sequencing errors, and they indexed uh, the resulting Debrain graphs using a new data structure, which was called Bixi, uh, and also provided the Debrain, the clean Debrain graphs on an FTP, which is very nice because the, the data are shared with the community. Uh, the difficulty is that the data are huge. The Debrain graphs, uh, in the Mac Cortex format, which is the program, the software which they used for cleaning the data, have approximately 12 terabytes of data after the cleaning. Uh, this essentially means that it's almost impossible or very hard to even download them from the website. So we asked the following question. So could we somehow compress these entire microbial corpus so that everyone could use it? Is there a way how can we bring the whole corpus to everyone's laptop? And uh, the answer is yes, and I'll show what we did. So we got very inspired by the, compress by the concept of compressive genomics, uh, which was published nine years ago and uh, presented, I think, at that time at ISMB. And this paper uh, in Nature Biotech there then came with the idea that if we want to keep up with the data being generated, we need algorithms they, that can compute directly on compressed genomic data. And the authors also made the observation that actually the biological data which are available in sequencing archives are not some random data. They have a very strong geometrical structure. And uh, in uh, like from the viewpoint of math, they have very low metric entropy, which is a very important feature. So in our case, we are working with microbial, da micro microbial data. And so this is some specific type of data where we can use additional information. And the first trick which we do, uh, which we want to do, so I, 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 maybe I should once again restate the problem. So we have a huge collection uh, of De Bruyne graphs of microbial species, and we want to compress them as much as possible so that people can easily download them to their laptops. So 
The first trick which we use and the first observation is that biology provides us pretty good priors on the data geometry in case of microbial species. And uh, as it is known from the literature, microbial samples form distinct clusters corresponding to individual species. And it has been shown recently in Nature Communications. Uh, we have amazing genome databases like RIFC, for instance, and these databases provi provide a good prior on these clusters. The clusters can be co identified using metagenomic classification, using methods which already exist. And the obtained clusters can be used for a parallelized compression and indexing. So now let's look how it looks more like graphically. So if you imagine the very high dimensional space of all microbial data sets, so every point here, uh, you can think of, for instance, a sample at SRA. Uh, one important thing uh, to, to emphasize here, you consider only isolates, only bacterial isolates and viral isolates, not metagenomes. Uh, now, when you add the reference genomes to, to uh, this space and look at them, these, these are the squares. So when you do sample identification or metagenomic classification, so it essentially corresponds to a Voronoi decomposition of this space. For metagenomic classification, for species identification, identification essentially means that for every circle, you are looking for the closest point, for the closest reference. You are looking for the nearest neighbors among the squares. And why this decomposition is so useful? Because this is what allows us to parallelize our computation uh, while maintaining uh, compressibility. Uh, so now uh, we can look at just one species and uh, basically iterate through the whole corpus and process one species at a time. And now we are using the trick number two, which is hierarchical representation of Kindred data. So let's look at the Kindred sets within a single species. So we have a species, we have clean debris graphs for all of the samples of the species. Uh, the debris graph is defined uh, like the vertices are the Kindreds and uh, the edges are K minus long overlaps. And uh, when we look at the specific Kindreds, we always can observe that. There's, there are many Kindred redundancies, which is natural. These are bacteria uh, of the same species. So they have some core genomes, so some genes which are common for uh, all, all of the bacteria. There is, uh, there is some accessory genomes, so uh, these genes are present only somewhere. So we will see that some of the Kindreds are present everywhere. For instance, the Kindreds corresponding to core genes, whereas some other are uh, present only in some of them. But in general, there's a huge, huge redundancy. And uh, this is because individual organisms are a result of an evolu evolutionary process. And the important thing is that the underlying phylogenetic tree can, gu can guide the data compression. So we can use phylogenetic trees to establish hierarchical representation of species scalar sets. So we infer a phylogenetic tree. How it looks like practically, uh, we use mesh tree because that's probably the fastest available method. Uh, mesh tree is essentially like a simple pump pipeline which combines two different things. First, mesh uh, min hash sketches for computing a distance matrix and quick tree for neighbor joining. Uh, honestly, this is the main bottleneck of the whole approach of everything what I'm presenting today. Uh, because tree inference is a hard problem in general, and so it's worse than uh, quadratical. So that's the reason why we have to go by species. Theoretically, if we were able to infer one single tree for the whole microbial corpus, we would be done. And we even wouldn't have uh, to do these tricks like uh, going species by species. Uh, we then use the obtained phylogenetic or estimated phylogenetic tree for chemical propagation to reorder or simplify the Kindred data. So Kindred propagation is an iterative procedure where we go node by node uh, from bottom to the top. And at every point, we take the compute the intersection of the children and move the intersection up. So in this case, the intersection of children is AT and TC so for, for this node. So we take it, take it up. Then again, we compute the intersection and we see that now the intersection is the Kimber AT and move it up. So we then end up 
with this hierarchy, which is a lossless representation of the Kamer sets. Uh, as you can see, like most redundancies already at this stage were removed uh, because now the Kamer AT appears only once, the Kamer uh, TC appears only once. On the other hand, not all of them, which is natural. Uh, so, for instance, the Kamer the uh, CA uh, did not propagate. So, to like evaluate how well this approach worked, uh, we defined what we called removed redundancy, which Basically, it's a ratio of how much we propagated compared to how much we could have propagated theoretically. So in this case, we removed 75% of camera redundancies. And that's an important metric, which uh, we will be using uh, in the future. And now the third trick, once we propagated the cameras and we have a tree and we have camera sets at every node of the tree. Uh, so. So this is this is the tree with, with the Kamer set. And the trick is now that we compute Simplitix, which is a concept which has been introduced at DSB uh, one year ago uh, within a common uh, within, within a uh, joint uh, joint presentation. Uh, in the meantime, uh, the concept was published now. Uh, one paper is in genome biology because it, it, it was co-discovered by two groups. Uh, the other one was published at Recomp. So uh, Simplitix uh, can be thought, uh, you can think of basically more lightweight Unitix. Uh, it's a method how to represent camera sets using strings. It works very similarly to Unitix with the only difference that we don't stop at branching nodes, which allow us to do better compression on one hand. And on the other hand, Simplitix are easier and faster to compute. But you can uh, we could even use Unitix instead. It wouldn't make at this stage a huge difference. So as you can see, basically from the camera sets, we obtain uh, we obtain individual text strings, which we store in some file, uh, usually a FASTA file. And to be able to interpret uh, this file, we still need the tree because it gives us the information about uh, which camera sets were uh, like uh, present there in the tree. And now we are almost done uh, in our approach. So uh, we can either use standard compression algorithms to compress uh, the resulting FASTA files. And why this is advantageous, uh, it can remove the remaining redundancies. So for instance, as you can see, we were not able to get rid of uh, two occurrences of the Camber CA. So uh, this last step, the lempel zip mark of chain compression can do this. Uh, or we can use basically an arbitrary method for Camber indexing and Camber querying because the result of our approach was against a FASTA file, even though the data were organized in some tree. So, and these data are simplified compared to the source data. So you can see this method as a data reduction uh, to limit like things like me memory footprints. And then uh, you can combine basically any program for uh, camera indexing and camera querying. So now let's see the overall workflow. So at the beginning, we have a collection of samples, collection of De Bruyne graphs, cleaned De Bruyne graphs from SRA, like half million samples, a huge number. Uh, first, we identify the species using standard methods of metagenomic classification, which is easy and well-studied problem. Uh, then one step which I didn't talk about uh, is uh, that we some clusters are too big. So we still need to split, to split them into batches. Uh, because otherwise, what would happen is that for species which are overrepresented in SRA, uh, the tree inference uh, would take too much. Uh, so we need to do, to do some kind of like cluster size normalization. So we split it into batches. And I will talk about this uh, two, uh, two slides later, uh, how we actually do it. And then basically we can deploy all of these on cluster and we can compute uh, the hierarchical representation for these individual batches. So let's see how it looks like when you, when you uh, do all of these steps uh, on the entire microbial corpus. So the first thing to observe is that there's a huge variability in the data quality. And this is why the compression is tricky because these are not uh, nice, cleaned assembled genomes. These are pretty dirty camera sets. So when you look at the top 
10 most represented species, you will see that there's a huge variability uh, in terms of number of cameras which are present there. And of course, uh, many of these things are, for instance, contaminated, contain a uh, lot of technological artifacts, uh, bioinformatics artifacts, and so on. And uh, we need to be able to compress even these. So when you run the camera propagation for all the species, for all the batches, uh, the results are pretty optimistic. So the first thing which you see is that for big batches, and I should explain what are, what are the axes here on this graph. So uh, the X axis here is the batch size, uh, number of billi billions of gamers in the multi-set union. So you have a batch which consists of, let's say, 4,000 De Bruyne graphs. And uh, when you look at the total number of gamers uh, within these De Bruyne graphs, as the multi-set union, that's what, uh, what's here denoted as the batch size. Uh, and uh, on the y-axis, we have the removed kin redundancy as we defined it several slides ago. So what we saw is that for the big batches, the important ones, the ones which uh, basically drive the size of the corpus, uh, most of the redundancy gets removed immediately by the camera propagation. And when it happens that camera propagation is less efficient, it's only on the small batches, which is either because there are very little data, there are just few genomes of the species, for instance, or it's viral genomes, which can be tricky because uh, they, they have much higher variability. Uh, you can also look at individual points, at individu in individual batches, how they group together. And uh, you see, for instance, that like the batches of mycobacterium tuberculosis are clustered at one point, Salmonella enterica and E. coli, and these are the most compressible ones. So the reason is that human pathogens are very highly studied. Uh, most a huge part of the data on public corpuses are actually human pathogens, and especially the most dangerous ones. So in, in the result, they are very similar to each other. So they are very highly compressible. So if you are developing a method for like compressing uh, data of one species, uh, pick up one of these three species. These compress, uh, these compress really the best. Uh, we also evaluated how well we compress within a single species. So we compared how many uh, bits per cameras we would require for Unitix, uh, for Simplitix without the propagation, uh, Simplitix after camber propagation, and also we experimented with the burroughs wheeler transfer, and we compared like the uncompressed, uncompressed data compressed using BZ2, using XZ, using LZMA, uh, the common compression, uh, the common compression method. And uh, from our experiments, it turned out that uh, LZMA and MA has the best compression rate, but it's very unpredictable in terms of time. Uh, which is necessary to finish the computation. So we decided to, to go uh, with XZ, which is much more reliable. And for instance, uh, with, uh, on this example of Neisseria gonorrhea, when we compress the whole species, we can get approximately uh, to 0.125 uh, uh, bits uh, per camera, not a distinct camera, uh, camera in the multi-set union of the De Bruyne graphs. We also looked about uh, at the, like the structure of data within individual species. So this is a distance matrix for Neisseria gonorrhea. Uh, the experiments were ordered uh, by the time of submission. So what you can see here, for, so more white it is, the closer it is. Uh, darker it is, more distant it is. It's a uh, Jacquard index after some transformation so that uh, you can really visually see the patterns. For instance, the black stripes or dark stripes, at, uh, like at the beginning with the old samples, these are old uh, 454 samples with many sequencing errors. So they are very different from anything else in the database. So when you, when you are looking uh, at distance matrices on how like uh, these different data points are similar to each other, uh, you can figure out that when you zoom, there are always squares of high similarity. And our current working hypothesis, which we are trying to confirm, is that these are typically single studies. So things within a single study are more similar to each other, which is very natural, because uh, these, uh, the, the, these samples typically are sequenced using the same sequencing protocol. Uh, the, the strains of the species are usually very similar to each other, and so on. 
So it's very, very intuitive. What is the implication of this is that when you do, when you want to split the samples within a species into individual batches, you need to preserve these squares if you want to maximize compressibility. And one way how to do it is basically to, to uh, be constructing uh, the batches sequentially. So that things which were sequenced at similar time uh, are grouped together within a single batch. So, and now what are the results for the entire corpus? So the number of the samples is over 400,000. Uh, there are approximately uh, 41 billion uh, distinct cameras, canonical cameras. Uh, using camera propagation uh, in the way as we described it uh, in this talk, we can reduce it, uh, we can reduce the number of cameras with multiplicities, so in the multi-set unions, uh, from uh, 1,500 uh, billion cameras to approximately 200 billion cameras, so approximately seven to eight times. And overall, we were able to reduce the corpus from 12 terabytes of data to approximately 75, so that it can fit uh, on a normal flash drive. We also created MOF, uh, the, the abbreviation stands for like microbes on flash drive. It's just a program for downloading and decom uh, decompression of the data. So we provided all the data on Zenodon. Uh, MOF is ve very much inspired by the Brew program for, for program installation on uh, Unix machines. Uh, I either love the tool because it's super easy to use and super intuitive. So the philosophy is very, very similar. You can install MOF from PyPy and soon it will be available also on GitHub. Uh, it works very easily. You just install it and you just then write MOV, get, and the accession of the sample you're interested in, and it will it will download and do all the decompression and you will get the brain graph out of that. Or you can decompress, uh, download and decompress the whole, uh, the whole, the whole batch or like everything. Uh, when, I, when we tested it uh, on our laptops, we realized that it's very fast and uh, downloading and decompression everything uh, can be done within approximately one night on a decent laptop. So now I'm getting to the conclusions. So it's still very much work in progress. And uh, these were just like quick slides, which I was able to put together within several days. So. Uh, so so it, it was not perfect, but we believe that uh, this is the first methodology for a lossless compression of truly large collections of De Bruyne graphs. Uh, when it's applied to the complete microbial corpus as uh, of, I think, 2018, uh, it's possible to compress the original Mac Cortex files from 12 terabytes of data to approximately 75 gigabytes so that it's downloadable uh, from the internet easily. It can be put on flash drive. It can be easily transmitted. Uh, the method can be combined with many existing approaches for camera indexing and camera compression. And this is what we are currently working on. We try to evaluate how well it can be combined with individual methods. Uh, it's still work in progress. Uh, there, will be up, there will be updates soon, including comparison to the other approaches. So, so thank you for the attention. Okay, thank you very much. I'm uh, looking at uh, some activity on the chat, but I see no questions. No questions related to your talk. And uh, so I can invite uh, more questions on the chat. So it looks like there are no questions. Uh, and uh, well, I, I really like your talk, and so I uh, thank you again for uh, for this presentation. Thank you again.